Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kilowatt. My name is Bodhi, and I am your host. And on today's show, we are going to sit down with Allison and Steve Sheridan, and we are going to get an update on their solar and whole home battery. And really, the overarching question or the theme to this show is, can I turn on the dishwasher now, or do I need to wait? So let's go ahead and welcome in Steve and Allison. Thank you, Bodhi. Hey, Bodhi. <laughs> This is, this is already going swimmingly. Um, I wanted to have you folks on because in the past we've talked about your uh, getting solar and then we talked about you getting a, a battery pack, two of them. And now we have what I'm going to just describe as the comedy stylings of managing energy in your home or man managing the battery in your home. So most of this is, is me going to just refereeing what we're going to talk about today. Why don't one of you start us off? of what we're looking at here, because I'm looking at a, a diagram that you can find on podfeet.com. Tell me what I'm looking at, Allison. Okay, so the setup we need to give you is that Steve and I are both engineers. We both have masters in engineering. Uh, mine's in mechanical, his is in electrical. And uh, we've had solar for over a year now. We've had the battery for, I don't know, six months, something like that, the, the whole home battery from Tesla. We've got all kinds of great metrics. And I would say probably every third day we get into a discussion of how this all works. And uh, I'm using air quotes on discussion. It ends up being heated arguments about, no, no, it doesn't work that way. It works this way. No, we should toggle this switch. And it's gotten uh, – it's interesting because it doesn't appear to be resolving. The, the big diagram that I drew was to try to explain – uh, what the priority is of where power comes from, from the sun, from the grid, from the battery, depending on conditions of whether you've got the the uh, uh, grid is up or the grid is down. Is the sun out? Is the sun not out? And I don't think that any of that's wrong yet. Is it, Steve? No, I don't think so. <laughs> However... So, so that diagram... <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so I think w one of the challenges here is that Tesla with the, by the way, the two uh, batteries that we have are Tesla power walls, two plus. And um, I think the challenge is, is that there are a lot of con user controlled options in the Tesla app to control the batteries. And that causes a lot of differing conditions that are maybe hard to nail down under these conditions of sun, no sun, grid power, no grid power, and so forth. Yeah, that's a good description of it, because if you have too many toggles and switches, it gets hard to follow what what is the end condition of those decisions. So probably the best place to start on this is when you look at the um, energy controls and settings for the entire electrical system. So in our in our house with the Tesla app, we can see it at a, instantaneously, we can see a nice little animation of the power coming in from the sun, how much is going towards the house, how much is coming from the grid, how much is going into or out of the battery. So we can watch that real time. It's really cool. It's a great graphic. In fact, great it's graphics. probably what sold, yeah, it sold me on the, getting Tesla over Enphase. Because the app is just really, really cool. And, and but I will add, um, we weren't sure about this because, remember, we got non-Tesla solar panels a year before we got the Tesla power walls. And we weren't sure how well the power walls would integrate with the solar panels. And it, it, it was seamless. It's like those are Tesla panels in terms of how much energy is, how, how the energy is reported and how the graphics appear. It's it's identical to as, as you would uh, see from Tesla uh, solar panels or, or what do they call those, uh, tiles? So that, that part works great. But now when you go into the settings, that's where things get really interesting. So, um, one of the big differences or switches that you can toggle is between self-powered and time-based control. And I'm going to try to describe it. And then Steve will tell me where I make mistakes. <laughs> yeah, I, I expect him not to be shy on that. Um, Self-powered is basically be as green as possible. Whenever possible, use energy that you got from the sun and you stored in your battery. That That's pretty much what that, that toggle means. Would you agree with that, Steve? Yes. With, with a modification we'll talk about here in a bit. <laughs> right, right. Another slider, so then, another switch. 
Right. So the, so the second option, you're just deciding between these two things. The second one is called time-based control. And if you live in an area and have a power company that uses what's called time of use, then it matters when you use your energy. So I'm actually a fan of time of use. I think it's a good idea. It complicates things, but the idea of time of use is they want to incentivize you to not use power during peak hours because if they can get people to stop using it during peak hours and use their battery instead, then they don't have to to fire up what they call peaker plants and maybe have to use uh, nuclear or coal in order to supply energy to this to the city. So they want to incentivize you. So we're on a time of use plan that's specifically for people with batteries, and it's twenty one cents a kilowatt hour. Is that mm-hmm. right, Steve? Mm-hmm. I get the units mixed up every time, which is a lot of fun. Steve gets real tired of me getting it wrong. 21 cents a kilowatt hour during the normal hours. And then during peak hours between four and nine, it's 51 cents per kilowatt hour. So we're really disincentivized to turn anything on between those hours if we're not using the battery or the sun during those hours. So time-based control is designed to make it be as pe- as cheap as possible. The time-based control in the, in the Tesla app is as cheap as possible for time of use. So they make sure that you're never using your anything but battery or solar during that time. Mm-hmm. Does that make I sense think, so far, Bodhi? I think Bodhi? you got that so far, yes. pretty accurate. Okay. So you would think that that was, there you go. You just pick one and you move on. But... it it gets it gets real weird in there so if you turn on time-based control let's say you've got plenty of let's say you've got 50 percent battery at 10 in the morning uh and you've got solar coming in it's filling it up sometimes what started to happen was that the grid would start to fill the battery even though we had a lot of power coming from the sun and maybe we would have had enough battery by the time we got to four to nine, but it was like, well, I'm not sure. And you said to make sure it was full. So I'm going to go take some of this coal, uh, you know, burn it up and try to shove uh, electricity into your battery during the day so that I'm sure that between four and nine, you don't ever use that, that peak power plant. Okay. So just to restate that, uh, cause I, I was under the assumption that the solar panels never fed the batteries. Is that not correct? No, actually, it's kind of the opposite. The preferred, the default configuration is the solar panels feed the battery, well, feed the home first and access to the battery. And Uh, then if there's any more left, go to the grid. Okay. I thought it went to the grid and then the grid went back to the battery. Now that's just depending on where you live. Or maybe I'm just wrong. It could be, and this gets into some of the subtleties. (laughs) So I think in time-based control, this is the second option. I I think that may actually use the grid more often to to meet that condition Allison spoke of, where it wants the battery as full as possible leading into the peak period. So you never have to use grid power during the peak period. But I think the other thing that um, time-based control may do is also possibly sell back battery power to the grid um, if it's expensive and you could get a, a good deal by, by supplying energy back to the grid. So, Steve, are you talking about the um, – well, with the particular plan we have – uh, there's an option for if there's a if there's a storm or if there's a power outage, we can sell energy back to the grid at what two bucks a kilowatt hour, I think. Oh wow, uh, that's actually a, a third. <laughs> We're getting now a, a couple layers. That that's called the uh, the Tesla. Well, shoot, it's not Stormwatch. Stormwatch is is to charge <laughs> up the battery in anticipation of a predicted storm, even if. So, in that case, you yeah, I didn't say be... Stormwatch, by the way. Oh, I thought you did. What did you What did you say? Well, I said if there is a power outage, then you can sell energy back to the grid during that power outage. But yeah, he, he's right. There is also Stormwatch. So let's do Stormwatch first because it's easier to explain. Okay. Go ahead, Steve. So this is a, a, a toggle switch. If you turn Stormwatch on then your battery will behave a little differently. It will 
Uh, if there is a predicted storm, and by storm, I think it's some combination of wind and rain and the levels, I'm not sure. But in your local area, Tesla is monitoring the weather. And if those two thresholds of rain and wind are exceeded or are anticipated to be exceeded in the next day, the power walls will charge up as best they can. And if there's not enough solar, they will start pulling from the grid to get you at 100 percent. And they won't pull power from the battery. Your your home won't pull power from the battery until they're in the storm watch period, time period. In other words, it's setting yourself up to have maximum backup power in the event of a grid outage. That's that's the storm yeah, watch but, mode. And the way I understand it, it's any potential natural emergency. So wildland fires. Hurricanes, obviously, but if it knows a hurricane's going to land in three days, it can start storing up that power so that the whoever the homeowner is will have power after ah, it hits if they're still good in the point. Area. I I didn't but, think about other national or national disasters. But here's here's the problem with storm watch is is it says okay well there's a giant flash flood hitting all of California or the the entire South Bay of California of Los Angeles County and it'll start pulling from the grid and we don't live anywhere near like flood areas or anything like that we we can tell that we generally get much milder weather than most other areas so uh, right now Steve you got it toggled off well and I was surprised I, to see that when I just went into it. There, there's a reason why. So you can toggle this on and off. It's total user discretion. Even during a storm event, you can turn it off if you want. You or can leading opt up out. To a, you can opt out. It's a toggle switch. Of a specific, well, no, there's a toggle and there's an opt out button. So you can have it toggled on, but you can go, oh, I know this storm isn't really going to be that bad. Let me opt out of this storm. Correct. So, but you have it turned off for some reason, Steve. Yeah, so... <laughs> There's a, uh, a program in California called SGIP, and it's a, I think it refers to self-generation incentive program. And it, it's basically uh, a program that allows people who have installed batteries or storage systems to get a rebate on their um, battery installation cost. It's not solar, it's, it's battery only. And um, to to qualify for that program, you have to show that you are, you haven't just installed batteries and you just keep it charged up. You have to show that you're using the battery power and draining it down to 30% or less over certain time periods. That's and right. If, we have to be draining it, too. We have to be draining it. And if Stormwatch is on, enabled, it wants to charge the battery. So that would disqualify us from being eligible for this SGIB, SGIP rebate. So we have that turned off. And we're about to be we're about to be audited basically on in, in order to get that check. They're going to come look and make sure that we've been using up our battery and giving, you know, giving the battery back, giving the energy back to the grid. Oh, that's interesting. And it's a pretty or, substantial rebate. It's I think 17% of the cost of installing the battery. Oh yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So so, okay, that's, so that's why we turned off Stormwatch. But then so the other thing we've been referring to, uh, we've alluded to, is the, the Tesla virtual power plant feature. And this is not um, available in all states or in all um, municipalities with different electrical services. But here in Southern California, for Southern California Edison, our electric provider, it is available. And this is the one I think you were referring to, Allison, where if you're participating in this... Um, the power company can take control of your battery during a, a a peak event to avoid, as Allison mentioned, turning on or resorting to peaker plants. They can start pulling from all the homes that have these virtual power plant batteries enabled and reduce the load on the grid by using or the generation load, if you will, uh, the, the actual power generation by using battery power instead or to augment the normal power and therefore avoid brownout or blackout conditions during super high peak periods, say super hot days where everyone's turned on their air conditioner, that type of thing. Um, but the beauty, the huge incentive there for the virtual power plant uh, participants, because, you know, as Allison mentioned, we, we pay up to 50, 51 cents a kilowatt hour peak, uh, you know, during the peak periods. If we, 
for every kilowatt hour we put into this um, virtual power plant uh, time period, we get two dollars a kilowatt hour back. So it's four times you 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 earn four times as much as you would pay using the energy. So it's 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 quite it's quite a good deal for the participants. And the nice thing is you can change it on the fly too. So like, let's say you're getting down to about 50% because you've been selling this energy back and you're like, ooh, the storm's kind of going on for this outage going on. I want to make sure that I have some uh, energy for myself. So you can say, okay, that's enough. So you can, it isn't like this thing, these things where the power company can say, turn your air, your thermometer or your thermostat up two degrees and you can't do anything about it until next year when you can opt out. Yeah. Again, you have full control over whether the feature is on for an extended period or within a given event, whether you want to stop participation during the event. So we should get back to the stuff we don't understand, though, Steve. Okay. We think we understand <laughs> this part. The real fun. So, so remember, we had self-powered versus time-based control. Self-powered as green as possible. Use the batteries as much as you can. Time-based control. Make sure you never use a, a grid power during four to nine. That's kind of the two things. But there's also a, a third thing called grid charging, and it just kind of showed up in our app recently, right, Steve? Yeah, we didn't have this option available, or you could see the toggle, but you couldn't toggle it on. And one day it showed up as being available that we could enable grid charging. And, and we don't where know it what it confusing. means. I mean, <laughs> naturally, yeah. it would mean you could allow charging your battery from the grid. That's kind of the, the logical assumption. But we already had seen that it had charged from the grid to prepare for the storm, you know, in the storm watch mode. Uh, as and, an and also in time-based control. It did it there, too. And that's where I can't quite remember it the same way you do, but but I, I'll trust you. <laughs> See, he's being all polite, Bodie. The, 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 the real way he says it is, that never happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it could have been because the, the feature changed. Uh, it, one day in the app, it was a different switch, a different appearance. Um, and I don't know if that's because... Um, Tesla or Southern Cal Edison just enabled it because this is very dependent on your power company. Some companies never allow this. They don't allow you to charge your battery from the grid. Others do. So this is based on what I, I a quick Google search here, which is a lot of research for me, but the <laughs> Powerwall, the, the federal incentive tax credit has to do with like you would get a 30% That's different. Yeah, I, I, that's this different. is that's separate this from SGIP. This is SGIP. different. What I'm this is a SGIP third is a California state uh in program just for battery installation whereas the federal program is a tax a tax credit for all solar and battery installations and it has right. nothing to do with how much you drain your battery. It's just the installation right. cost for solar or battery. Wonder why that's cuz when I typed in the 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 um screenshot that you had with the grid charging it brings me to a tesla support page have you seen that about about the I, federal I investment tax but that's grid charging. so there, so Is we got different? we got the we got the tax credit for when we put our solar in we did it when it was 27 percent. it's 30 percent now we got federal tax credit great then we installed our, our batteries. We got 30% tax credit on that. This is a third thing. This is the, if you got to type in SGIP to see it, and it's a long, complicated thing that I'm not quite sure why we were eligible for, but the uh, our solar installation company applied for it for us, and we were granted it, and we're close to actually getting paid it. We were supposed to get it paid last year, but they didn't and, get it. And it's California-specific. Okay. I don't think it's available in Arizona yeah. or other states. Some other states may have it, but I haven't heard of it. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. So now this grid charging toggle <laughs> says, enable this when you're allowed to grid charge. Powerwall will use the grid to charge your backup reserve and for daily use in time-based control. And that's the thing where I said it used to do that automatically. And I think maybe now it doesn't unless you toggle this. But the fun thing is if you say yes, it says grid charging may have tax implications or <laughs> may be restricted by your utility. Confirm with a tax professional and your installer before enabling. That I don't yeah, understand. So weird. <laughs> I yeah. click no. <laughs> yeah. 
So here's where things get really exciting, Bodhi. It's eight o'clock and I need to run the dishwasher. How do I tell whether that's a bad idea or a good idea? If I didn't have solar and I didn't have batteries, I would know that between four and nine, that was a really bad idea because I was going to pay extra. No matter what time of use plan I was on, that was going to be bad. Even if my power company wasn't on time of use, I would know it was a bad thing for the environment, right? But now if I'm in, let's say we're in self-powered mode where it tries to use the battery as much as possible. Steve, can I turn on the dishwasher? It's eight o'clock. Uh, so I would say if you look at your battery level and it's above your minimum threshold, remember you you as the user can set the minimum level you will allow the battery to drop to in terms oh, of we charge. We didn't talk about that yet. Right. So you set that. If you are well above that, 10, 15, 20% above that, I say, yes, turn on the dishwasher because you're not going to hit the minimum and then resort to grid charging. You'll still be have enough from the battery to accomplish your task even during the peak period. But if your battery's getting close to your minimum threshold, I wouldn't turn on the dishwasher. Do, do yeah, so this sense? threshold he's talking about is you got a little slider that we've got our set to 30% backup and 70% self-powered. So during as long as we're within that first 70%, we're going to be able to use the battery anytime we want. But we've told it always reserve 30% in case there's a power outage. That's the idea. So you, he's saying, like, if we're at thirty five percent battery at eight o'clock at night, you know, why don't you wait until the sun's up tomorrow to to run the dishwasher? Right. Because a, a high, I don't know about a dishwasher, but an oven or charging a car. If you do that with only five percent left, you're going to quickly consume that five percent margin. Get down to thirty percent. You'll stop draining from the battery and start t- pulling grid power, and that's what you don't want to do during the peak period. And then uh, this is based on, I'm looking at your chart, but I'm also basing this off of a, a memory from the last time we talked about this. Your oven and your EV charger are not on your backup battery, right? Well, <laughs> right. <laughs> however, okay. however okay, this, is, this is very odd. This was a surprise to us when our system was installed. Even though they are not on our back, the battery backup, they call those the critical circuits, we can still use our battery to power those two items, our oven and our EV, if the grid is up. Okay. And I know that doesn't necessarily make sense intuitively. Why would the grid being up allow you to use the battery to supply power to those? But that's our observation. You can see in the test lab very specifically how the power is flowing. And if I turn the oven on um, and we have power in the battery, the battery will power the oven. The one caveat is the our two batteries have a limit of how much instantaneous power they can provide at a, at a given time, how much current and power, and that's 10 kilowatts. And we can, our car being charged plus our house draw can be more than 10 kilowatts, instantaneous power draw. In that case, it would pull 10 kilowatts from the batteries and then the remainder would pull from the grid. Okay, so you're still saving. So, yeah. so hang on, Steve, you use the word can. You said we can charge our car or run the oven from the solar, from the batteries. If but the grid is up. We don't have a choice. It will, right? We can't change whether that happens, right? Well, it, we could, by, <laughs> we could if we um, move the backup slider to a level that, you know, when you hit the minimum level in the backup slider, it won't pull from the battery anymore. Right. OK, so let's say I, I want there to be uh, I'm a little concerned because there's a cloud in Southern California. I see a cloud. I'm a little scared, a little worried <laughs> about that. I could drag that slider up to 90 percent and then charge my car. And it would use the grid. Yeah, well, if, if you're at 100 percent charge, no. But if you've let the battery draw down to 90 percent and the slider is set to 90 percent minimum, yes, it would pull from the grid. That's a very weird way to control what's what's doing it, right? But it is a, a good hack if that is something you're concerned about. Yeah. Yeah. But we don't we don't charge our cars between four and nine, right? You, we make a point no. of doing them overnight. How come? And that's because that's the reason that is is if you our car is the one thing that can deplete our battery faster than the four hour period from four to nine or the five hour period. That's the one thing that will deplete our battery faster than anything else. 
So if we charge our car between four to nine, I'm pretty much guaranteed we're going to switch over from battery power to grid power during the peak period. That's why I push the car charging off beyond nine. Okay. Do you follow? Bodie, you'll like this story. We were we were down at our daughter's house and uh, uh, I was watching her. Her husband was loading up the dishwasher and they have the same kind of dishwasher we have, a Bosch. And I see him press a button that says delay, and he presses a button twice, and it delayed it by two hours. I've owned our dishwasher for nine years, did not know it had a delay. So <laughs> rather than ask Steve, I always delay it till after nine o'clock on the dishwasher. That's a safe thing to do. He, I, I just found out that our washing machine has a delay, but our dryer does not. Uh, oh, that's dumb. Yeah, it's super dumb because I don't care about when the washer dry washes close. It, it's minimal it's amount of electricity. It's the dryer that I care about. Is it an electric dryer? Yeah, they're both LG. So that's weird. not too bright. Yeah, I bought them at the same time. It was my mistake. Yeah, ours is gas. But the main thing I, we I wanted to get across was that as as two engineers with uh, with twelve years of education between us. We have spent an inordinate amount of time discussing this and debating and saying, what does this mean? What does that mean? Why did it do this? Watching the little graphs going, no, 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 no. Look, you can see it going this way. No, it isn't. It's going that way. It's it's hard to manage, really. But I think a lot of people don't get into it as much as we do. They just say, oh, it's working fine. Just let it go. Or maybe you just pick one of these options and go with it. I, we care too much about it. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, just a second. <laughs> You think you guys get into it a little too much? I heard a story <laughs> where you guys uh, uh, positioned a cup of water in the microwave to see where the best place is to get the water to boil the most. That I, is true. That's <laughs> Lindsay's fault. That's Lindsay's fault because Lindsay said it was better in the middle and we both thought it was better on the edges. What was the verdict? I can't remember. The middle. The middle, oh, the the middle. middle actually is We more. learned something and, and, from our daughter. Now we knew. Don't act all surprised. She's brilliant, but we. Uh, I'm going to tell her you. Said but I'm it like an electrical that. engineer, but, and I didn't know that. What we did know was that there are way, basically there's a there's a interference patterns inside that you can. Uh, one of the fun things, if you have a microwave you don't care about, or maybe it's your parents' house, uh, stick a light bulb in the uh, in the microwave, and it'll light. It'll get brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer as it goes around until oh. it explodes. Yeah, I, th I think those might be standing waves. <laughs> I'll do that at work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's why we thought, well, I don't know, for some reason that made us think the outside would be better. But uh, anyway, yeah, we're, we're a little nerdy. But imagine somebody who didn't care and wasn't all nerdy about this. They get it and it's defaulted to, say, time-based control. And they end up having to pay for all this grid power when they were generating enough. We generate enough energy to compensate for the, the amount of power we consume. And yet we were constantly pulling from the grid when we were on the time-based control. And that's what was bothering me. That's why I'm, I really wanted us to go back to self-powered because that's as green as possible, which was kind of the point. It's when you consume and, and when you give back that changes. I don't want to use the grid at all if I can help it. So I'm going to blame Tesla a little bit on their app. And I think their app is really cool. I mean, I, I have it for my solar panels. I don't have battery, obviously, but um, I think their app is really cool, but it I don't think it gives enough information to the people who want to dig down and find that information. I think it's it's just right for somebody who wants to maybe set it and forget it or do a little tinkering here and there, but I don't think it provides as much information as uh, my Solar City dashboard used to provide me. Like every day on mm -hmm. Solar City, I could look up so much information and all of that went away when Tesla went to this app. Um, yep. hmm. I don't think it's bad, but I, I stopped looking when Tesla took over and it changed to from Solar City to Tesla because it I didn't get as much information. I got a good glimpse of today or I got a good glimpse of right now. But in um in the Solar City dash panel, like it just gave it just gave me tons and tons of information. It was almost too much, but it was so interesting to to come through that information. Whereas yeah. and maybe it's just me, but whereas with the Tesla one, I glance at it and I'm like, cool. It's time to get up and uh, clean off the solar panels this week. Well, yeah. actually, I, I, I'm i surprised Steve said yep, as though he has no, any I agree. experiences I agree. in two different apps. Yeah, but well, you don't know what Solar City showed him. No, no, no. I, I agree that Tesla 
just gives you the first level of information for the average user. For instance, for self-power, it says, use stored energy to power your home after the sun goes down. Reduces reliance on the grid. But how? What is the algorithm? Or time base. Use stored energy to maximize savings on your utility rate plan. Gives you the lowest energy bill. That's the outcome. I want to know the algorithm. How is it accomplishing Yeah, that? but that's that's not really what he was talking about. He was talking about the data that he can get out of it. And we can get a lot of data. We've got a bunch of graphs we can look at. We can see the how much the house used on a graph as a function of time, how much how the it's fun to look at the battery because you see it go negative when it's charging. So right now when the sun is up, we can see that the the graph is going negative, it was going positive, it was using battery before six in the morning. Um, how much grid power you're using. And now we're seeing no grid power. And that was the graph that was bugging me when we were in time-based control. I kept seeing the gray bars going up, which was which was the grid. And you can you can see it by day, you can see it by month, you can see it by week, you can see it by year, you can see it by lifetime, you can export the data if you want. I don't know what no, data I, you, you want. There's a lot in here. Yeah, you uh, know I agree. what? I just while you were talking, I just noticed that you have an option to download your data. So maybe that is Maybe, maybe I did not dig into this deep enough. So I agree that a lot. the Tesla app provides you a lot of information on the outcome of your decisions, but it doesn't provide information on how the decisions are made as to how and when the power is routed. Those True. are two different things. Uh, yeah, yeah, one yeah, is yeah, outcome-based, yeah. results-based. One is what is the process to achieve that outcome? And I'm not seeing that defined. Okay, so we, we have to do experimental methods, change yes. the toggle, and and make sure you don't change the slider at the same time you're changing the toggle or turn on grid yes. charging and and then do an experiment watch what happens it's got to be the same kind of sunny day as before and and when you guys do all this and you have all of it compiled please print it out on a dot matrix printer and <laughs> <laughs> sure we will I do think, that for you. I think you're making fun of us. <laughs> you know, one thing I was surprised, I did a lot of reading about um, having a cl whether you should clean your solar panels or not, because I wanted to know how often we had to do it. And everything I saw said, no, you really don't have to. It really isn't a big deal. But we had a lot of um, uh, fires last year, and I'm predicting a rather large fire season this year since we now uh, had rain. And so we have new stuff to burn. But uh, uh, we decided, I found a, company that for like 120 bucks would clean our solar panels and said, well, that sounds pretty good. And what, what was the change in, um, it was uh, several percent, right? See, 5%. Yeah, it was, better? it was, a it was, uh, two or 3% from the previous year for equivalent full sunny days. And you can tell on the graphs when you have a full sunny day, which is the only way to really compare one day to another across a year. If you've got clouds, you can't really compare, but full sunny day gives you a nice smooth curve and we were getting um, two or three kilowatt hours uh, per day better after the solar panel cleaning. And it's actually four to four to six percent better. Yeah, I thought you said around five percent. Yeah, yeah. So it did make a big difference. Yeah, we we have really bad, especially in the area that I live in. We have really bad. Uh, they call them haboobs, but they're just giant sandstorms. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, I so after one of those or two of those, I got to go up there and clean it. But we also, I have a bird problem. I have, lots, I have two big trees in my backyard. My neighbors have big trees. Uh, big trees are a good. Bird problem. They're great, but uh, okay, they, they, they don't, they, they, they harbor birds. So mm -hmm. uh, those birds need a place to use the restroom. And the solar <laughs> panel seems to be their favorite place. Oh. Well, we're, we have a uh, two-story house, so um, we don't climb up on our roof ourselves. It's it's just too high and too scary. Yeah, and the second story is not easy to get to, the second story roof. Plus, we have clay tile roofs, which are difficult to walk on without breaking. I, I, I mean, I don't know if you remember this, but I have uh, probably 50 tiles behind my house. Maybe not 50, 25 tiles behind my house stacked up just because I do that very same thing. I'll walk up there and break a tile <laughs> and have to yeah. go and replace it. Hey, we're geniuses. We had the, when we had ours put on, I think we talked about it the first time we were on the show uh, to talk about having solar put in, but we had the tiles removed on two faces of the, of the roof, and then they had to shingle the roof and then put the solar panels on and then decoratively put this, this uh, tiles back around it. So we had like 50 tiles sitting around and we said, yeah, just haul them away. And then three months later, we decided to have the house tented where they broke like 20 of the tiles. And we had to go buy, buy them. So <laughs> we should have just gotten some from your house. You Poor yeah. I think they're the similar <laughs> S-shaped tile. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I'm pretty sure we don't know when to run the dishwasher. Steve is convinced, by the way, at any moment of any day, he knows exactly how this is all working. So Mm, that's good. I don't know about convinced, (laughs) but got a good idea. (laughs) Wait until the AI starts managing it and we just don't have to look into that black box. (laughs) Let's not go down that. (laughs) No, you don't want to AI talk? I almost never Mm. talk about AI on my show. I know a lot of people are sick of it, though. So if if your recommendation, let's say, uh, you know, a bozo firefighter and his very smart wife decide to get solar panels and they don't want to dink with uh, every day um, changing the, the settings back and forth, would you recommend power walls to folks? I, I would. I would. Yeah. I think they're really cool. I, I would. And, and I guess... Ask yourself, are you trying to make it as cheap as possible or as green as possible? And then decide on those two switches based on that. Yeah, I would say both. Both. (laughs) No, you can't have both toggles on. You have to pick one. Yeah, they're probably not the cheapest way to go, but they, I still think the the user interface to control, to do the basic controls is good um, with batteries uh, integrated with solar. And Tesla Powerwalls are more per battery are generally more powerful than the average batteries out there. Most batteries out there are about 10 kilowatt uh, hours a piece of storage and Tesla power walls are 13 and a half. So, and that was the same price r- at roughly the same price. Now that probably yeah. varies depending on where you're getting your power wall through a third party from Tesla directly but for us, it was they were comparable in price for thirty five percent more power. Now, to be fair, the Enphase was the other company that had a, the ten kilowatt hour batteries for the same price for the same ten thousand dollars a piece, and uh, but they were a newer battery technology. True. There, I remember something about some liquid thing. I forget. We did we did a big comparison and then said, well, the Tesla apps really need it. Yeah, and the other thing about Tesla Powerwalls is I think they are liquid cooled. So, and and some battery technologies out there are not. So, in, you know, as an engineer, I tend not to like complexity and having to have liquid cooling is an added complexity. Um, so that's one more thing that could break with a Powerwall. I haven't heard stories about it, but it's, it, I always have it in the back of my mind. Yeah, for the most part, I have not come across a lot of stories of people being dissatisfied with their power walls or having to have a lot of maintenance done or whatever. And I will say, anytime I have an issue with my solar panels, I go to the app, I type in the issue, I get a call back, get a scheduled appointment. Like they, they come out and they take really good care of me. So, are they Tesla panels? Well, there's Solar City panels, but Tesla manages it. Oh, Solar City, got it, got it. Yeah. So when we did ours, uh, you can only do a at the time you could only do a lease with Solar City. So we have leased panels. Hmm. But uh, we paid our lease up front, and it was very cheap at the time. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. All right. I think that's where we'll leave it today. Allison, where can folks find you if they want to uh, listen to your wonderful voice? The uh, Everything Good starts with podfeet.com. That's where you can find all of my podcasts. And when we do video interviews, you can find the uh, videos that Steve produces of the interviews. But you can always hear me talking on a bunch of different podcasts over there at podfeet.com. Excellent. And how about you, Steve? Are you going to plug your YouTube channel? Sure. Uh, you can find me on YouTube at SP Sheridan or Steve Sheridan and on Mastodon at SP Sheridan at Astrodon.social. Astrodon, A-S-T-R-O-D-O-N. It, it's so, one of the so, services. Oh, and my Mastodon's. Go ahead. <laughs> at Podfeet, at Podfeet at chaos.social. And I have a Mastodon, but I don't remember what it is. It's. 918 digital <laughs> at twit dot social I think but I could be wrong on that yes I think that's what it is I but I don't check it, it so don't don't send me there you should check it it's so fun on Mastodon get over there so much more engagement forty times the engagement of what I'm getting on Twitter on the same post I'm not I'm not kidding forty times per follower I will start reluctantly 
<laughs> All right. Thank you both for coming on and chatting with me about this. All right. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Bodie. All right. I want to thank Allison and Steve for coming on the show and sharing their experiences with us. It was a lot of fun for me. Hopefully it was a lot of fun for you. Before I let you go, I do want to give you a little update on my experiment with my car. So if you don't know, I'm running two experiments right now. The first one is Tesla insurance. My insurance company wanted to charge me $1,400 extra every six months for the Model Y. So I decided to go with Tesla insurance because the higher your safety score, the less you pay. Currently with the Tesla insurance, my safety score is 96. So I would pay $127 on my next bill if everything stays the same. I still have an opportunity to bring that down. My highest I've ever been was 97, but I did something to drop that down and I'm not sure what it is or what it was, but that's where we sit right now. I'll give you fuller updates as you know this continues, but I've only had the car for a week, so I don't think I can I can give you a full picture of that at the at the moment. The next one is I'm trying to see how long I can just charge off of a regular 110 volt outlet in my garage without having to install a level two charger. And as it turns out, one weekend, not very long, not very long at all. <laughs> um, I started my experiment with 81 miles because I wanted to be kind of low. And um, in the time that I talked to you last, I, I've been to work and back. So I did charge a little bit at work, but I didn't charge for the full 48 hours that I was at work because I wanted to keep it somewhat consistent to the amount of charging that I would do at home. Um, yeah, it's it, this is really hard. Yesterday, which was Thursday, I was driving around. I had about 60 miles left on the car, and I thought I was done driving for the rest of the day. And I was like, okay, well, this isn't the end of the world. Um, came home, plugged in. My wife came home uh, for lunch, and uh, we were talking about some things, and I realized I had forgotten to do a bunch of stuff that required me to do a fair amount of driving. So I had to drive from our house to the supercharger, that's sitting outside the Mills Mall, and uh, put about a hundred miles in it, so I can, so I can, so I could do, <laughs> I could do my uh, my errands that I had forgot I needed to do. So yeah, week one of level one charging, not great. I failed. I had to put nine dollars and sixty four cents of electricity into the car, so that um, I, I made sure I didn't run out of juice. As my car sits right now. I think we have uh, about 190 miles on it because I haven't driven it at all today. But yeah, this is a fun experiment. It is a little bit stressful. You have to watch it. Um, I'm definitely going to get a level two charger and I'm unsure if I'm going to be able to make it the full, uh, <laughs> the full six months. I should have maybe made it a more realistic three months, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. All right, everybody, hopefully you enjoyed today's show. I will talk to you on Tuesday. I hope you all have a fun and safe weekend. 